Adumilang, Liam Ochetwe Momochai, Siana Mogela, Rooted Fellowship. Welcome, Bayons Kek. Welcome to church. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Uh, if you were thinking that we maybe place Bukanyong, then you know that after Kat's answer, we don't place people in Sabora. <laughs> And then, Elder Bungani, I think I know who that person is who makes that coffee. It's Chippo and Kendra. Okay, so if you love the coffee, go through there and check it out. Uh, Church, if we haven't met, my name is Jono, and I have the privilege of serving here as one of the pastors, as Elder Bungani said, and I serve under the leadership of our lead pastor, Pastor Onimo Katle, who's currently away today doing something pretty epic. So today, this Sunday, is three years since Fellowship City, a church plant from this church, was, go- had, was launched. That's three years of God's faithfulness. And so Pastor Oni is currently, probably right now, preaching at Fellowship City uh, at this very moment in time. Him and Confidence and the family have gone through to be with, with Reno and, and, and Marie. You'll remember that Reno and Marie were with us uh, for a couple of years doing a residency here. Uh, you'll also remember maybe the Tulo family, the Gatley family, and they went as part of a group sent out from Rooted Fellowship. They're also an Acts 29 church, and man, what a privilege it is this morning to, to celebrate in what God is doing. Amen? And so I'm going to pray. Yeah, give it up. So let's pray for Fellowship City right now uh, as we come to this moment. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Three years of your faithfulness. But Lord God, it's actually been may, way more. Pastor Reno came here. The, the, the Mayer family came here. The Tulos, the Gatleys, Lord God. This special group of people that you brought here, you raised up and then were sent out. We thank you for the way in which you've used them for the past three years to be your salt and light in Centurion, uh, for the way in which you are using them to reach many for your name's sake. Lord God, we, we pray for, for more, more disciples, more people to come to know you through that work. We pray for the Fellowship City Church. We pray for the community. May they be drawn closer and closer to you. And as they are drawn closer and closer to you, Lord Jesus, would they be drawn closer and closer to one another. We pray for powerful, amazing, amazing things to happen in these next three years. Uh, may we get together again at, 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 at more interactions at other times, and may we reflect on even more of your goodness yeah. and uh, faithfulness in their lives. We thank you that we can be family like this, the, the global church, and we thank you that we can pray for one another, bear one another's burdens. We pray that you would continue to bless the work of this church in an amazing way. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So this morning, family, uh, I get the privilege of wrapping up our Psalms mixtape series. Psalms mixtape. Now, I know that many, many of you are thinking, wait a minute, didn't Pastor Oney finish that up in August? And you'd be correct. Uh, but as with the best of any musical item, they deserve a reprise, right? Or an encore. And so that's what we're going to get this morning. I was in a rock band for many years, and uh, it only happened twice that we had an encore. But man, when that happened, the one time, we were so unprepared, we were like, what song should we play? Don't worry, we know what we're going to be preaching today. Okay. As a fitting finale to our Psalms mixtape series, our encore is going to consist of a, uh, if you're younger than 33, a mashup, and if you're older than 33, a medley. You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. Uh, so it's going to consist of a mashup type medley. Uh, at the intro of this, of this series back in April, we said that as part of our year of worship at Rooted Fellowship, we felt led to dive deeply into the songs of the Bible, the book of Psalms. And although we never went through every one of the incredible 150 Psalms contained within this beautiful poetic wisdom book found in our Old Testament, over the course of this year, we covered a playlist of some 16 tracks of the most well-known and the most quoted Psalms. And this morning, I have the privilege, as I've mentioned, of preaching the encore from the tracks that that so many of us have been waiting to hear and no doubt delighted in, as the band read four of the five for us this morning. The conclusion to the album of Psalms, Psalms 146 to Psalms 150. Now, if I may, uh, if I may just rewind our tape just a minute, you'll recall that our lead pastor, Pastor Oni, kicked off this year by saying that we at Rooted Fellowship have declared 2024 as the year of worship within our church. And he took us through our anchor verses for this year, found in Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. And I'm going to read from this anchor verse once more this morning. Found in chapter 12 of Paul's letter to the Romans, verses 1 to 2. I'm going to be reading from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. And of course, it'll be up on the screen behind me. Let's hear from God's word, our church's anchor verse 
verses for this 2024 year of worship. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. We sang it this morning. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Family, this is the word of the Lord. And so thanks and praise be to God. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you and we praise you for your word this morning. Lord God, you are everlasting, you are good, you are holy. We sang about this, Lord God. You are magnificent, eternal, everlasting, glorious, merciful, gracious God. And we come to you this morning, adoring you, Lord God, for who you are. Our minds can't even fathom the vastness of who you are, Lord God. All that you are and all that you've done for us. And at the same time, Lord God, because of the work of Jesus Christ, we can come to this space and think on you pray to you, connect with you, and connect with your people. And so we just want to pause in this moment and say, we adore you, we love you, we praise you. Hallelujah, Lord. I ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, right now that you would come, that you would move amongst us, move in our hearts, move in our minds, move in our our actions, move us to action when we leave this place, move us to obedience, Lord God. Would you come and have your way amongst us right now? Would you bring clarity? Would you bring your truth? Would you bring yourself to us right now, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Okay, so uh, I quoted from Romans 12, verse two. Can you believe Pastor Onyo, he preached from that way back in January. And when he did that, he said this. He said, we worship because we are in awe and wonder of who God is and what he has done. We worship because we are in awe and wonder of who God is and what he has done. And we're going to see today that our Psalms mixtape encore serves as a powerful reinforcement and powerful reminder of that truth. How amazing is it that that God's infallible word contains multiple texts written centuries apart on the same topics of praise and worship, and yet they contain the exact same sentence. One commentator uh, named Peter Batterser commented on our anchor verse, Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, and he said this, he said, Paul is calling us to a worshipful response to God, to not hold anything back, to lay it all on the line. Give yourself utterly and wholly to the Father, your body, how you eat and sleep and work and serve. Doesn't he deserve this? And what saturates your thinking? We are transformed at the revelation of himself in what he has made and in what he has done. How then should we live in view of such manifold perfections while he wants us to hold nothing back in the life we return to God? Hold nothing back. He bids us to pour out our bodies, pour out our minds. He wants us to give it all, to praise him with everything. He's calling us to praise our creator and our Lord and Savior with everything we have. Hallelujah, praise God. And so in light of that this morning, we're gonna dive deep deeper into some of the psalms of praise. Some of the psalms of praise, specifically the ones I mentioned, the praise psalms 146 to 150. As I mentioned, the band have already read these psalms beautifully this morning, four of them, and they crafted them so beautifully and intentionally and thoughtfully into our time of sung praise and worship. Thank you, band. And so I'm not gonna reread all the psalms right through from beginning to end. But as always, I encourage you to come back to these psalms during the course of your week. And I'm going to attempt to pull out some truths from each of the five psalms as we close out this series in the form of a medley mashup encore. So, Psalms 146 to 150. Before we dive deeper into our encore, let's remind ourselves, I've said this every time I've preached on psalms, let's remind ourselves of some of the relevant and significant contexts contexts for our texts. Let's look at the contexts for our texts this morning. You'll remember that the book of Psalms is a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers from the various periods of the nation of Israel's history 
written by a number of different authors. Many of the Psalms were used by the choirs that sang in Israel's temple, or they were prayed as liturgies by families at home, but rooted fellowship. The book of Psalms is not merely a hymn book or a prayer book. And I say that because after the nation of Israel's exile to Babylon, these Psalms were carefully put together and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms that we have before us today. And it was arranged in such a way that it's been said that the book of Psalms is like a virtual temple whereby one enters into the Psalms to meet with God and to listen to the story of God's kingdom sung back to one in poetry. The book of Psalms is a virtual temple whereby one enters the Psalms to meet with a glorious, magnificent God and to listen to the story of God's kingdom sung back in poetry. And our book of Psalms is concluded by our text for today, Psalms 146 to 150. We saw this already in the introduction uh, of the series. The introduction of Psalms is made up of Psalms 1 and 2. And then it has this internal organization into five main parts, very originally titled Book 1, Book 2, Book 3, Book 4, and Book 5. How do you guys know? (laughs) Now we've seen over the course of, of this year and throughout our Psalms, that there are lots of different kinds of poems in the book of Psalms. But they all kind of fall into one of two categories, okay? Poems of lament, poems of praise. Generally speaking, they're falling into two kinds of categories. Poems of lament, poems of praise. What are poems of lament? Poems of lament express pain, anger, confusion about the brokenness of this fallen world and they cry out to God to do something about it. There are a lot of lament poems in the book of Psalms, which tells us, family, tells us that lament is a good and proper response to injustice and evil in this world. Some people need to hear that. Lament is a good and proper response to injustice and evil in this world. God can handle it. God can hear your laments. The people of God are called to call out injustice in the world, to lay our cries before our maker and to pour out our sorrows to him and to one another. Just come out of a series in Philemon and we saw that giving one another the space to share, to listen, to empathize, to lament, to repent, to reconcile and to forgive is a core part of a Christian's life. Lament is a good and proper response to injustice and hurt in this world. God can handle your laments. He says, bring them to me. In preparing for the message this week, I found it interesting to discover that lament poems tend to occur more in the earlier sections of the book of Psalms, in books one through three. Now, of course, there are poems of praise contained within books one and three, one to three, but poems of praise, they tend to be dominated Later on, in in books four and five, in books one to three, there are more poems of lament. Why is that? Why is it that poems of praise tend to dominate later on in books four and five? Well, poems of praise are ones of true joy and get this, ultimate victory. Ultimate victory. And they point to what is good in this world as they tell of what God has done in the world and in the lives of his followers thanking God for his goodness. In books four and five of Psalms, praise poems, they outnumber the the poems of lament. All of this culminating in the five-part hallelujah conclusion, Psalms 146 to 150. And these five poems of praise to God and joy in God all start and end with the word hallelujah. Hallelujah which is a Hebrew pr- phrase that calls a group of people to hallelujah, praise Yah, which is short for God's divine name, Yahweh. Hallelujah, praise Yah, Yahweh, praise God. Praise God, hallelujah. And so what's happening here? Well, there's a shift from lament and then to praise throughout the book of Psalms. And remember, it was arranged intentionally. So this is clearly intentional. And it tells us something about the nature of true prayer within a Christian's life as a whole. Tim Keller says this, he says that the shift of focus from lament to praise 
teaches us that all true prayer pursued far enough becomes praise. All true prayer pursued far enough becomes praise. Starts as lament, but becomes praise. And even though these prayers may take a long time or even a lifetime, if it's a prayer that addresses God as he truly is, and if it's a prayer that engages the world as it truly is in all of its brokenness, it will eventually end in praise. Hallelujah. You see, family, because as Christians, we long for the kingdom of God to come fully. Your kingdom come, Lord, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. And we say this, and as we say this, we are lamenting the brokenness of this fallen world. We're lamenting the fragility and the, the, often just the futility of our lives because we are not called to ignore the very pain of our lives. Remember, we are called to lament it. Jesus, God's own son, Jesus, fully God, his own son, never ignored anyone's pain, never ignored the pain in anyone's life. But family, biblical faith calls us to look to God's promises and to look to who he is and what he has done in the midst of what we are experiencing. And as we reflect on this, our response eventually, through pain and frustration and disappointment and heartache, our response eventually is one of praise and worship, thus enabling us to show up in the world as salt and light, and as Christ's followers who are ambassadors on mission to be the hope to all nations, amen? family, Jesus Christ, God's own son, came to earth, was born of a perfect virgin birth, lived a perfect sinless life, died a perfect sacrificial death, was dead and buried. Three days later, he rose conquering sin and death. He has ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back to make all things new. Hallelujah. Family, this gospel, this good news means that Christians can look expectantly to the Resurrection Sunday as we are experiencing the horrors of Good Friday. It means that we can look to the resurrection as we remember Jesus' rejection. And because he is coming back to restore all things, we can praise God, hallelujah, no matter what we face as we joyfully anticipate Jesus' coming return and celebrate the victory he has already won. Root of fellowship, family. God is to be praised because he is the helper to the helpers. Hallelujah. God is to be praised because he is the creator and restorer of his people. Hallelujah. God is to be praised in heaven and on earth. Hallelujah. God is to be praised with dancing, with our bodies. Hallelujah. God is to be praised with singing and with our words, with our mouths. Hallelujah. God is to be praised with his very own living word. We should pray this back to him, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Psalms give us a great example of this. God is worthy, hallelujah. Yes, indeed, in view of God's great mercy, we are called to offer up our lives as a living sacrifice in an act of worship. And so, with all of that being said, we're gonna take a closer look at our five hallelujah Psalms, the the conclusion to the book of Psalms. We start with Psalm 146. Psalm 146, we're just gonna look at a few verses. And in Psalm 146, we see that we can praise God. We can praise God by appealing to his justice and then trusting in his justice. We appeal to God's justice, we lament, and then we trust in his justice. Let's look at verses seven to nine. It says this, he remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects resident aliens and helps the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. God is just. Here the psalmist brings praise to God. He praises God, hallelujah, by appealing to his justice and then trusting in God's justice because God guarantees justice for the most vulnerable in society. God guarantees justice for the most vulnerable in society. The poor, the prisoner, the hungry, 
the physically impaired, the weary, the immigrant, the single parent. He names all of those whom are in the greatest need of justice, those most vulnerable in society. And because God cares and loves us so much, we can trust in his justice. Amen? Yeah, amen. Brother and sister, are you crying out to God for justice in your life? Amen. Family, did you know that you can actually praise him by bringing your laments for justice, and you can rest and be confident that he hears your cries? But not only that, you say, how do I know that he cares so much about the most vulnerable or that he is a God of justice? How do we know this? Well, he proved that he cares so much by giving up the comforts and security of heaven and by becoming a vulnerable, helpless baby born to poor parents. He became vulnerable himself. He then lives a perfect sinless life, died the most agonizing and excruciating death in order to satisfy God's demands of justice against sin. And he did this because we are all so vulnerable and in desperate need of a savior. Yeah. We could not save ourselves and so he comes and he satisfies God's demands for justice against sin. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So we can praise God, family. We can praise him by appealing to his justice, by lamenting the injustice in this world, and then trusting that he is a God of just, justice, who hears us, who will move, and who will bring all things into perfect harmony now or when Jesus comes back. Amen. Sure. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. How else can we praise him? How else do we offer up our lives as a living sacrifice in view of his great mercy? We praise, we praise him by appealing to his justice and trusting in his justice, but how else? Psalm 147. We can praise God through obedience to his word. We can praise God through obedience to his word. Psalm 147 calls us to praise God with our obedience to his word. Verse 11 says this, Verse 11 of 147 says this, the Lord values those who fear him, those who put their hope in his faithful love. And then in verses 19 and 20, it says, he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and judgments to Israel. He has not done this for every nation. They do not know his judgments. Yeah. Hallelujah. Family, some of us need to hear this. God has a high view of his word and yeah. obedience to his word. Yeah. Amen. It is the infallible word of God. And throughout scripture, God's people are called to fear his word, to delight in his word, to study it, to meditate on it, to memorize it, yeah. and to follow it. Now hear me, please don't miss this. This is not to say that God is a God who only engages our intellects, not at all. He most definitely engages our emotions. He created them in us. We were designed to feel and experience emotions and to experience his presence and his spirit. God himself, we were designed to do that. He can be known and experienced, not just merely known about. Yeah, amen. But especially as we think about the year of worship and spending time in the Psalms, which we have been often been called and referred to as the songs of Jesus, we need to hear this. Family, if you get only get an emotional experience out of worship gathering or a devotional time or a worship song in the car or in the gathering. And if that's all that you're essentially seeking all the time as you journey with God and you're not at all concerned about being willing to be obedient to God at his word, well then that's like essentially coming to God like your personal ATM machine. You're coming to him for all you can receive from him without giving yourself to him fully through praising and worshiping him with your living sacrifice of obedience to him and his word. Man, I loved our praise and worship time this morning. Full of a little joke. What do you get when you have three amazing worship leaders and a professional musician? That. Does it need some work? Yeah. Family, we cannot be coming to God merely for an emotional experience. We, it needs to lead us to obedience to his word. But don't mishear me. Christians are saved by faith, not by obeying the law. Yeah. But this, the law exemplifies for us how to love, how to please and how to resemble the one who saved us, yeah. Jesus Christ himself, the living word. 
In Romans 8, the chapter that the Spaces Getaway last weekend was centered around, I'm sure you guys could tell me this, I'm sure even more. We see that we have a new identity in Christ. And as part of this new identity, as redeemed and forgiven and free children of God, we have the Holy Spirit living in us who leads us to delight in God's law and empowers us to live in obedience to His commands. Family, obedience is an overflow of our salvation, not the means for obtaining it. And similarly, rooted fellowship. Similarly, if we are following God's word in our own strength, but without any joyful, spirit-led, and empowered worship and praise, well, we have an incomplete gospel. And so, Lord, as you indeed engage our emotions, would your spirit empower us to praise you with our obedience to your word. Hallelujah. So we can praise God, offer up our lives as a living sacrifice by appealing to his justice and trusting in this justice and by obeying his word in the power of the Holy Spirit. Are there other ways to praise him? Yes, Psalm 148. How else do we praise him? Psalm 148 says this. says that we praise God in unity. We praise him with our unity. Psalm 148, verses 10 to 13, this is what it says. It says, wild animals and all cattle, creatures that crawl and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, young men as well as young women, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His majesty covers the heavens and the earth. You see, family, the scripture, this scripture in particular shows us that when you cross the line of faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you come into harmony with the rest of creation, yeah, which is also crying out in praise to its creator. And so our unique redeemed voice is now added to this beautiful and harmonious chorus of praise. And so this, and through this, this praise, we are united to one another. We have a common purpose glorifying God as we sing in this praise anthem together. And so family, we need to bear this in mind. We have to bear this in mind as we pursue unity within the body of believers, both the local church and the global church. And in fact, we've just seen this, right? We saw this in our previous series in Philemon, but we've also seen this over the years as we've pre preached through many of the other of Paul's letters from the, uh, uh, to the church. 1 Corinthians, in Ephesians, in Philippians, in Colossians, to name but a few. Paul calls the people of God to insistently, aggressively pursue true familial unity. To not just paint over the cracks with peacekeeping efforts. We need to enjoy, embrace, and reflect the diversity of the church and not allow God's beautiful creative differences to be sources of contention and division within the church. Root of fellowship, we cannot allow for our preferences to become our prejudices. We can't allow for preferences to become prejudices against practices that are God-honoring, wise, communally enriching, edifying, and biblically permissible. We can't allow for our preferences to become prejudices against practices that are God-honoring, wise, communally enriching, edifying, and biblically permissible. You can't do that just because you happen not to enjoy them. We don't do them like that. Family, it's clear. We praise God with our unity. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. This is a big one. Without our unity, without our unity, it affects our witness and it brings discord to the global church and the song of praise of the global church. Our witness is affected and brings us beautifully to our next point. So how do we praise God? How do we offer up our lives as a living sacrifice? Well, we praise God by trusting in his justice, by obeying his word. We praise God with our unity. And now we praise God by actively participating in a great commission. Amen. Psalm 149 calls us to praise God by telling others about him. Verse six says this, let the exaltation of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. You see, family, once we have been declared righteous because of Jesus' saving work on the cross, 
We are adopted into God's family, and we become part of the church, the people of God. And after this, we are sent out into the world as salt and light to tell the world about Jesus. So now, for the nation of Israel, whom this psalm was originally addressed to, this verse 6 referred to them waging literal war against the nations that openly rejected Yahweh. But for the Christian, the people of God, this side of the cross, the sword being spoken of in this verse 6 is actually the gospel of the word of God, which penetrates defenses to the gospel. How do I know this? The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so we can praise God by telling others about the love of God and testifying to others all that Jesus has done in our lives. This is not something that we outsource to a mission agency. Those who are gifted with evangelistic gifts or those in full-time ministry, no. Jesus gives the great commission to all who would put their faith and trust in him. Pastor One challenges us regularly. He says that if you can't remember the last time that you shared your faith with someone, it's telling. Because we're out there telling people about something, shows we like, Activities we love, food we enjoy, places we like going to. We can't wait to tell somebody about the latest celebrity thing, what's going on in the church, this scandal. What about the savior of the world? What about the savior of the world? When was the last time that you told someone what he did in your life? It doesn't need to be a fancy, theological, perfect gospel presentation that checks all the boxes. You can praise God by simply telling someone else about what Jesus did for you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's a famous quote. I'm not too sure I said it, but they said essentially telling, sharing your faith is just one beggar telling another beggar where they found bread. Mm-hmm. When last did you share your faith, what Jesus did in your life with somebody? Hallelujah. We praise God by trusting in his justice, by obeying his word, by being unified with one another, by telling others about him, and we praise him for all eternity. We praise him for all eternity. I'm gonna call the band up as we come to Psalm 150. I'm gonna read this slowly. Psalm 150, the final psalm, the final part of our encore in this mixtape psalm series says this. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expense. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundant greatness. Praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Family, this psalm gives us a glimpse of the new heavens and the new earth where everyone, everyone and everything is bringing glory to God fully and completely. Where all things are enjoying, praising, and worshiping God forever. Forever. In some ways, this unimaginable future, everything praising God everywhere in every way, it's it's hard to imagine, but we have a glimpse of it here. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so family, family of God, as we come to the end of this this series, mixtape, as we come to the end of this encore, as the encore begins to wrap up, We praise God. How do we offer up our lives as a living sacrifice in view of his great mercy in this year of worship? How do we praise God? How do we worship him with our lives? How do we obediently follow him? We praise him by trusting in his justice, by obeying his word in the power of the Holy Spirit, by being unified with one another, by telling others about him, 
and praising him forever and ever and ever. And so Root of Fellowship, as we come to the end of our last track, the encore has come to an end, the music's quietening down, the track and the album are wrapping up. And even as we draw closer to the end of 2024 and our year of worship, what is, what is our response? Gospel demands a response, and so what is it? In view of God's great mercy, how will you respond? By offering up your life as a living sacrifice in worship and praise, Will you praise him for his justice? Hallelujah. Will you praise him with your obedience? Hallelujah. Will you praise him with being unified to your fellow believers? Hallelujah. Will you praise him by telling others about him? Hallelujah. Or will you even be there praising him for eternity? Or is all of this something that you've actually never heard before? Perhaps you've been hearing it your whole life, but for the first time, it's as if the Spirit of God is using it to speak to you and make it real to you this morning. That the God of the universe came down to earth and made a way for his people to know him, to love him and to spend eternity with him. If that's you, won't you come up here after the gathering, respond in prayer and thanksgiving, and then share this with one of the folks, of the leaders up here up front afterwards. We'd love to come alongside you, to pray alongside you, to rejoice with you, to join that unending anthem of praise together with you as you bring your harmonic voice to that. Or perhaps you're a follower of Jesus and something has struck a chord with you this morning. Family, remember, we can praise God by crying out to Him about the injustices of this world and then trusting not only that He hears us, but that he will indeed exact his justice at his chosen point in time. Oh, how we need that. We can praise him by obeying his word. Are you being called to follow his word even more closely as you leave this place? Is there something in his word that you're ignoring? Is there something that you're being disobedient to and you know it? Won't you take that step of obedience? We've been here these past few weeks. Is there somebody you need to have a conversation with? That you need to forgive? You need to say sorry to? Is there somebody you need to reach out to? We praise God by telling others, who is God calling you to share your faith with? Is your one more sitting next to you at home and at work, at play, or even sitting next to you right now in the chair next to you? Would you praise him by sharing your faith with that person? Now, come Holy Spirit right now. Would you show us your one mores in our lives? Hallelujah. And I'll ask you to stand as we pray. Pray together. Come to the end of this. Oh, good God. We thank you that, that as your word is revealed to us today, we will praise you for eternity. We thank you that you are a God of justice, that you will indeed exact your justice. You are a God moving through this world, Lord God, that you use the people of God to bring justice. We praise you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your word, which shows us how to live and bring honor and praise and glory to you. Would you, Holy Spirit, move in our lives to be obedient to this word? Lord God, we pray for your unity in this church, in local churches around the world, in the global church. Would we be a unified body of believers on mission, Lord God, to a world in desperate need of a savior? Would others look at the church, Lord God, as your salt and light, drawing many, many, many to you? Lord God, would you move us to share the hope we have found in you with those most dear to us and even strange to us, Lord God? Would we be on mission for you? We thank you that we will praise you for eternity. Lord God, I pray for anyone here now that has come to know you and come to meet with you and come to know you for the first time now. Would you move in their lives deeply, Lord God? We thank you for this time. We praise you. We love you, Lord Jesus. In God's name, Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah.